1, 2, test, test, test. 1, 2, 1, 2. J'ai rien. Ah Voilà. Welcome to everybody. It's my pleasure to open the 2018 Geneva Challenge Award Ceremony. And I wanted to give you a warm word of welcome, particularly to those of you, uh, the finalist teams who have uh, come from uh, all over the world uh, and worked uh, hard to be the best, to be the winning team. Um, and uh, I would like to seize upon uh, this occasion, which is uh, always uh, dear to all of us, um, to say that we have been very fortunate uh, uh, that uh, somebody came to us with the idea of creating this uh, uh, international uh, graduate student uh, competition and uh, moreover came to us with the means to implement, to make it uh, work, and this was uh, the contribution, uh, immensely appreciated a contribution from uh, Ambassador Jeno Stelin. This is uh, to tell you how lucky we were to have somebody who brings you both the ID and the means. And uh, I would like, dear Yeno, to uh, thank you very warmly for your um, bright idea, your constant uh, inspiration, and your generous support. Many thanks. <laughs> Tonight, we are very pleased to have uh, with, with us uh, uh, Dr. Christian Parker, who is the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Oak Foundation, a foundation that uh, we all know for the admirable work uh, it makes in, uh, on uh, global social and environmental issues. Uh, in particular, those uh, that affect the, the, the most disadvantaged uh, people across the planet. Dr. Parker is a marine biologist and uh, is in charge at the Oak Foundation of the Environment uh, Program, which focuses uh, mainly on uh, uh, the uh, fishing. Uh, a stock problem and the climate change. So it's a great pleasure for us to have you uh, address the problem of climate change. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank you for your invitation. I'd like to start by telling you a, a story or an experience that I had recently. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at the Oak Foundation Environment Team's annual retreat. And at the beginning of the retreat, we showed a video, um, a video that was titled The Overview Effect. I, st I strongly suggest you take a look at it. It's, it's worth a look. In short, the overview effect is the cognitive shift in awareness reported by some astronauts during spaceflight, often while viewing our home, the Earth, from outer space. It's the experience of seeing firsthand the reality of the Earth in space, which is immediately understood to be a tiny, fragile ball of life, shielded by a paper-thin atmosphere. From space, national boundaries vanish. The conflicts that divide us become less important. And the need to unite a global community to protect this pale blue dot becomes both obvious and urgent. 
as one shuttle, space shuttle astronaut reflected, when you look at the planet and realize it is the only place you can see life, you start feeling protective about it. It's like a delicate crystal ball, and it looks alive. The first time I looked at it, I thought it was alive. This overlook can force a new frame on our thinking. Earth, its stable climate, its air, its soil, and its rich biodiversity are not natural capital that can be monetized or expended. It is life itself. It is our life support system. Yet today, we are reducing the chances of survival by wiping out insect life, tearing down the last of our forests to make way for industrial farming, and plundering our oceans for the last remaining fish. Now, some of you may too be too young to remember the original TV series, Star Trek. I'm a science fiction fan. But I can't get this image out of my head, that we are all standing on the bridge of the spaceship Earth, in this case, and all of the life support system warning lights are blinking yellow or red. Our planetary boundaries are being breached. We are flirting with becoming dead in space. And as another way of looking at it, a friend once said to me, it's like being in the back seat of a car that is racing towards a brick wall, but the driver thinks he's going to a party. We must act now, which is why I'm here today to talk to you about the Oak Foundation and our mission to play our small part in safeguarding all of our futures. Because this is ultimately about the future of all of you in the room, the future of my children, and the future of this incredible blue dot we call home. So, the Oak Foundation uh, formally came into being in 1983, and it is a family-led organization. Our work reflects the vision and values of our family, which are grounded in rights-based approaches, gender equality, and partnership. As a family, we are passionate about some of the most pressing and challenging issues that we face as a community. This is reflected in our funding decisions. This year, we'll have made grants valuing $360 million to support areas that include issues affecting women, international human rights, housing and homelessness, protecting children from sexual abuse and exploitation, and not least, protecting the environment, our life support system. Wildlife conservation and trade, marine protection and climate change, these are the three areas we focus our on our environment work. A program managed by myself and my nephew, Christopher. At 29 years old, he is our youngest trustee, and he is passionate about protecting endangered elephants and rhinos. He sees opportunity and hope in their survival. A marine biologist by training, I, will, I oversee our marine work, as well as the Koch's climate change work, our largest program. For me, tackling climate change is the greatest challenge we have as a community, and by prioritizing climate action, we will help enable solutions we need to achieve our foundation's mission. As Pre President Obama said, there is one issue we will, that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than anything else, and that is the urgent threat of climate change. We know that by burning fossil fuels, we are threatening our planet's life support systems. This science is unequivocal. A decade ago, global average temperatures were on track to rise four to five degrees by 20, 2100, signaling catastrophic impacts for people and ecosystems worldwide. And their international community was struggling to come together around comprehensive solutions. Extraordinary outcomes inspired and supported by civil society, philanthropy, governments, and corporations worldwide have cut projected temperature rise to about three degrees. This isn't a tremendous achievement, but it falls short of the one and a half degrees that we need to limit our climate to. So how have we managed as a community to, to achieve what is done so far? There's three, here's three big examples. One of them, international treaties. The most significant climate agreement of our time, the Paris Climate Agreement, it was a historic moment. It set a new course for cleaning up our global economy. Since then, a growing number of countries, states, cities, businesses, and investors are making commitments to climate change. Later that year, in 2015, a powerful global agreement to phase out potent greenhouse gases was signed in Kigali, Rwanda, which amended the Montreal Protocol 
an achievement that some experts estimate could reduce the warming by as much as half a degree. So 2015 was a good year for international treaties. The second example I'll give is the shift that we are experiencing today on how we move people and goods from A to B. From banning diesel cars to a global transition to electric vehicles, countries like the UK and France and Spain have announced that they will ban combustion engines in the future. Even the city of Stuttgart, the German car capital, will impose a partial ban on diesels next year. These new laws will help drive polluting cars off the road and force car companies to make more electric vehicles, which are cleaner and safer. This shift has been accelerated by the car maker Volkswagens being exposed by for cheating emissions tests. That scandal, known as Dieselgate, rocked the global car industry, which sparked a wave of public outcry, leading to new regulations and enforcements taking place in countries and cities around the world. In Europe alone, poor air quality costs us 70 million in health costs every year. Suffering under this smog of its own air pollution, China has become the manufacturing engine of electric vehicles. <clears throat> the third example I want to give is the extraordinary rise of clean energies, such as wind and solar, probably the best of the examples. Over the last decade, we have seen the cost of solar power crash, where by now it's the cheapest form of energy. Ten years ago, the international energy predictions on growth of photovoltaic electricity were very modest. They were dead wrong. You know who was closer to predicting where, how fast solar growth would, would happen? It was Greenpeace. Greenpeace had the vision to imagine where we needed to be. And the IEA got their predictions wrong year after year after year. Thankfully, that was the case. So, and that made me smile because that means that sometimes things happen faster than even, even the most visionary of us can be. So, from a both an environmental and economic point of view, it is now the technology of choice. This has dis disrupted energy markets and is driving investment away from heavily polluting power such as coal, our biggest obstacle to climate action. So it's clear that in recent years we have seen communities, innovators, businesses, policymakers, and philanthropies come together to make real progress. In these three critical areas, international agreements, the electric transport revolution, and clean energy boom, we have seen the changes that, that we need. But seeing as we are a country defined by beautiful mountains and vistas of a proud, and a proud history of mountaineering legends, I want to provide a simple analogy to describe where I think we are today. Imagine the great summit of Mount Everest is towering above us. We have made it to base camp. We know the summit is up there. We can't see it. It's behind the clouds. But the hardest, toughest part is ahead of us. It is fraught with uncertainty. The swirling winds of our politics blur our way forward, and we must think of those who come behind us. The fossil fuel industry's avalanche of destruction must not be triggered for their sake, if not for our own. So this brings me to the most recent sobering report from the United Nations Governing Body on Climate Science, the Intergovernmental Panel on Cl Climate Change, IPCC, October 2018 special report. It was a clarion call to prime ministers and presidents, corporate leaders, city mayors, all of us in this room tonight. Upon signing the agreement in Paris on climate change, the international community agreed in 2015 to pursue efforts to limit warming to one and a half degrees by the end of the century. It was a highly ambitious target, but one that must be reached to ensure the survival of the communities of people who live on small island nations or places like the deltas of Bangladesh. Last month, the UN report laid out a vast array of social, political, cultural, economic, and technological changes needed to meet this target. The world's leading scientists were clear. We have only 12 years to reduce global carbon emissions if one and a half degrees is to be achievable. Beyond this, even a half degree rise will significantly worsen the risk of drought, floods, extreme heat, poverty for hundreds of millions of people. As this chart shows, there is a big difference between one and a half and two degrees. We are already experiencing the devastating effects of hurricanes in the U.S record droughts in Cape Town and forest fires even in the Arctic. More increases will spell more extreme and deadly weather. And a stable climate is part of our life support system, the reason our civilizations were able to thrive. Yet we are putting that at risk. 
Poor air quality is killing seven to nine million people a year. What exactly is access to clean water worth? And the soil we need to grow our food? The impact on nature itself, the other part of our life support system, will be catastrophic. Insect populations, which are vital for pollination of crops and the survival of the winning, uh, living world, could collapse, threatening global food security and the livelihoods of the people who farm our lands. Some, some, there are some already some distressing signs in the insect populations. Corals will be all but wiped out at the higher of the two temperatures. But more than 10% have a chance of survival if we lower the target as reached. As a marine biologist, someone who spent much of his graduate days diving and studying the ocean, I find this truly heartbreaking. To think that many of today's unique and life-giving ocean species could be lost. The risks to our life-giving planet are great and our time to act is short, but I see hope. So I want to talk to you about action, what can and must be done over the next 12 years to give the planet and ourselves a fighting chance and the role that you can play as you start your careers. The Oak Foundation is part of a global community of philanthropies who can and must work together as catalysts to engage governments, the business community, and civil society to achieve the one and a half degrees. We're gonna invest in three different approaches, ending the pollution, First and foremost, we must stop the pollution. We can no longer burn coal, the most polluting and dangerous form of energy. For example, here in Europe, we are supporting a network of local community groups and organizations to transition from coal to clean power within the next 12 years. Clean technologies. From a purely technological point of view, we have what it takes to solve this problem. We have the power. There have been huge advances in improving wind and solar, as I have said, and even in the storage of these energies. And many of these technologies can be deployed more cheaply now than ever before. We must focus on bringing down the barriers to clean energy uptake and shaping the policies that clean up our way to power homes and businesses. We support the acceleration of electric vehicle uptake as a way of making our communities safer and healthier. Earlier this year, I was with Christopher in China to see a company that is building some of the 9,500 electric buses China is putting on the road every five weeks. 9,500, that's the entire London bus fleet. They're putting on the road every five weeks. That's the kind of speed of change that we need to see. There are also smart technologies being developed to remove pollution from the atmosphere. Right here in Switzerland, there's a company called Climeworks. They have developed a technology to suck carbon dioxide from the air. We need to get these technologies to scale. The third area of investment is people. We invest in people like you. We believe in the power of people. Or each of you in this room can be part of the solution. In your career choice, who you vote for, you have the power to change the course of history. We believe in the movement building, in movement building to create the demand for political action. By investing in movements in India and Brazil and Southeast Asia, we believe that we can make change the politics of climate change and social justice. To help deliver all of this, Oak was part of a, a funders collaborative that pledged four billion over the next five years to combat climate change. The largest ever philanthropic investment climate, uh, focused on climate change. And this is just the beginning. As the energy sector races to becoming carbon free and as our transportation sector begins to change, agriculture and our consumption patterns must also go through a revolution. Agriculture must from, go from being the source of carbon emissions to a sink. Those of us who can afford to have our meat consumption need to do so. We must feed the people of this planet without destroying our precious blue dot. We must do more and we will use this new money to catalyze action and, in, and investments by your governments and private sector. But I believe it is possible. Though, to those who say unre it's unrealistic, are telling us to give up on this amazing planet, to give up on your generation, to give up on my children's future. I do not accept this. It is unthinkable that we should give up on human innovation, courage, and hope. It is this spirit that led us to conquering the greatest summits and the frontiers of space. When Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit Earth in April 1961, he carried centuries of hopes and dreams into space with him. When he stepped back on firm Earth, the world wanted to know what he made of the vast expanse beyond Earth's skies. 
Yet it was not the vast spectacle of universe outside the planet, but the view of Earth within it that seemed to have made its biggest impact on the astronaut. Circling the Earth in my orbital spaceship, I marveled at the beauty in our, of our planet, said Gagarin, describing the Earth overview effect decades before the phrase be, be, was coined. People of the world, he said, let us safeguard and enhance the beauty and not destroy it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parker. Mrs. Anand, dear friends and students, a year ago, at the same occasion, we had the honor of the presence of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, the patron of this competition. He is not anymore with us. We mourn the loss of a charismatic and wise man and an admired friend. Yet his vision of a fairer and more peaceful world must persist. For us, he will continue to be our guiding star. I'm therefore particularly happy and honored to be able to welcome Mrs. Annan among us tonight. Mrs. Annan has been here before, accompanying her husband. Thank you for having accepted to come this year again and to hand over the prizes to the awardees. I know it's not easy to be here tonight. All the more, we appreciate your presence a lot. Advancement and furtherance of youth leadership was one of Kofi Annan's top priorities, personally as well as through his foundation. That is why he took interest in a competition that asks young people to show the way on how to tackle the problems that threaten the future of our planet. One of the threats we face is climate change, the topic of this year's competition. In a few days at the climate summit in Poland, participants will be faced with the IPCC's message that current efforts are not sufficient to limit the global average temperature below the goals set in Paris. The impact of people-made global warming on sustainable development are more devastating than was expected. Current efforts are not sufficient. More has to be done. The number of extreme weather events, such as extreme droughts, floods, and storms are becoming more and more frequent around the globe. Glaciers are melting at a speed never recorded before, which can lead to several severe natural disasters. Like last year, when in Switzerland we had one of the largest ever recorded landslides due to the melting of permafrost in the Alps. Thank you very much, Dr. Parker to have shown us very forcefully what the challenges are we face and how philanthropy can help us to secure a 1.5 degree centigrade world. You once said, I have read that, that the time you give to your philanthropic efforts is more precious than the money you give. Thank you 
for giving us your time. It is a gift we value a lot. There is no question. There is a risk of not doing enough on climate change. We need new and innovative solutions to solve the problems of climate change, and we need passion. That is what I find when I look at the submissions we have received this year again of brilliant young people from around the globe, some of them among us tonight. 66 teams, in other words, 259 students of 52 different nationalities from 47 different universities have taken part in this year's competition and have submitted contributions that are theoretically grounded, offer at the same time pragmatic solutions and are based on interdisciplinary collaboration between them. This year is the fifth challenge competition year. The first four years, we selected three award-winning teams. They were selected without geographic provenance taken into account. As a result, award-winning teams originated predominantly from European and North American universities. For sure, those teams very often had included students from other parts of the world. Yet, we want to encourage reflection on SDGs and recognition for such efforts, not only among students from Western, but as much so among students from non-Western universities who do not have the privilege to study abroad. That is why this year we have decided to award five prizes, one per continent, respectively region, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, Oceania, and South America. A sixth prize will be awarded by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth, directed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. We very much value the partnership with UNSDSN Youth that started last year and enables young people to connect and collaborate for implementation of the SDGs through platforms. Let me, before moving to the presentation of the finalists and the award ceremony, fulfill an obligation and an imperative desire at the same time. I would like to thank the team that made it possible and makes it possible every year to move from idea to realization. Professor Philippe Burin of this institute, the boss, and his assistants, Laurence Algara, Lena Menge, who is the coordinator, and Dario Pizelli from STS and Youth, the Academic Steering Committee, under the superb chairwomanship of Professor Martina Viarengo, supported by Professor Graciela Moraes Silva, Professor Ann Saab, and Professor Cyrus Shaik, and my wonderful and dedicated jury colleagues, Maria Luisa Silva, Janet Peace, Masao Takahashi from the World Economic Forum, um, Florian Schatz, and Florian Igli from Ital Zurich. All of them merit thanks and appreciation for their support, work, and support. That's it. And now I invite the winning teams to present themselves so that the audience knows who they are. Later on, we will tell you who are the winners. Now, the order in which I invite those 
teams has been, this has been decided by themselves, so it doesn't say anything about what the ranking will be. Um, we need some suspense. Um, so I would like to invite the first group, Nash from Columbia University, to give a presentation of their project. Have a micro? Yeah, yeah. Down there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Good evening, distinguished guests. On behalf of Columbia University's DASH team, we would like to sincerely thank the jury and Geneva Institute and Graduate Institute for offering your time and expertise during the Geneva Challenge. We are most grateful for the opportunity to share our proposal with you today, and we sincerely appreciate your input, which we will continue to use to operationalize DASH. I am Jessica, and this is the Columbia University team. Alonso, G, Mitasha, and Nigora. We are a diverse group of students who come from five different countries, all of who bring different skill sets and have uniquely informed the design of our project. Extreme variability in temperature and rainfall in the Sahel have dramatically increased in re recent decades, putting significant pressure on natural resources. And at the same time, the population is rapidly growing. There will be 100 million people in the region by 2020 and, by, and 200 million by 2050, which is almost four times the amount of the current population. The complex interaction of climate variability agricultural land expansion, and constrained natural resources result in increasingly restricted herder migration routes and intensified competition between farmers and herders. And in West Africa, these conflicts are moving increasingly beyond state borders, often contributing to already fragile security dilemmas across the Sahel. This phenomenon has had significant impacts on sustainable development. Our solution, Data Analytics for Sustainable Herding, DASH aims to decipher complex interactions between climate change, human mobility, and violent conflict using machine learning and artificial intelligence. DASH will do this in three ways. First, by mapping and visualizing the changes over time in climate migration patterns and allocation of natural resources. Second, by mapping the conflicts and analyzing their drivers. And third, by producing a near real-time prediction model of natural resource constraints and potential violent conflict hotspots using data analytics and artificial intelligence techniques. The data for the DASH tool will be obtained via satellites, mobile telecommunications, and government statistics. We will pilot DASH in Senegal, which is one of West Africa's politically stable anchors, because it represents, at a, at a country level, many of the trends that the Sahel is experiencing including an uptick in migration, resource constraints, and high-risk areas. DASH will disrupt the traditional approach to international development and public policy making by unpacking the complexity of modern-day herding, farming, and land use nexus. DASH aims to create a blueprint for utilizing data and, and applying machine learning and artificial intelligence for better decision making under deep uncertainty. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for this three-minute presentation. And um, now I uh, invite the next group, which is the group from Brax University, Green Organization. Earth average surface temperature has gone up by more than 1.5 degrees since late 18th, and two-thirds of that warming has taken place, taken place since 1975. Good evening. We are Tim Samul from Asia, Australian mix of Nepal and Bangladesh. 
Um, firstly, we'd like to thank Graduate Institute of Geneva for providing us opportunity to share our ideas regarding climate change. I'd like to introduce my team. I'm Sachina Paudil, Salman Pramun Khan, uh, Sagufa Raksanda, and Hassan Imtiaz. So moving towards our proposal, our proposed model is related with urbanization and climate change. And we have taken Dhaka City as an example for implementing our pilot project. Dhaka is one of the densely polluted city in the world which have been affected by adverse effect of climate change. Lack of spaces for plantation, less greenery areas are putting the Dhaka more at the risk. We therefore have came up with the ideas known as SAML. So what is SAML? SAML is a mobile app which will be accessible through various cellular devices, which will allow users to connect to the network of urban plantation group. And the objective is to make more greenery areas. Through this app, people can easily access our services by simply installing SAML application and registering their rooftop on the network. SAML will offer wide range of services, but specially focus on the two service packages. In first package, register user can give their rooftop as a rent to the SAML, where the building owner will earn money. In second package, register user can hire SAML to do farming on their rooftop for them, and that's a paid service provided by SAML. In both packages, the ultimate purpose is to increase people's participation through urban plantation. We also have waste management in our proposal, where we will provide two separate buckets, one for organic and another for inorganic, where organic waste will be used as a fertilizer in rooftop gardening. This project, SAML project, is actually a potential step towards dropping the effect of climate change, where rooftop gardening will save the space and increase plantation at the same time in urban area for reducing urban heat effect. Urban gardening will be a thriving issue in the upcoming generation, where climate where cities will be construct the major part of the countries. It is also the additional point towards attaining sustainable development goal 11, 12, and 13. There are several proven evidence that rooftop can lower the air temperature, and eventually more than 75% of the roof will have a major effect, measurable effect on the reducing temperature in the urban area. Thus, we believe that our model will be helpful in addressing climate change in the long run. This is all about the SAML project. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> May I now invite the next group, which is the group from Kenyatta University. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Graduate Institute of uh, Geneva, we are Majuhai team from Kenyatta University, and we are pleased to be here to present a summary of our project. We've already done it earlier, so we'll just do a quick summary. And um, we all know the impact of climate change on water availability. And the fact that Majuhai means water is life, that is what exactly our project is all about. Kenya is 80% arid and semi-arid, over 80% actually, and it continues. Probably in 2020 will be, or 2025 or 2030, will be 98% or something um, arid and semi-arid. And that is why we have decided as a young team of Africans to come up with a solution to help policymakers and to actually intervene at the community level as far as water availability accessibility is concerned for vulnerable communities in Kenya. And our project, Majuhai, basically has three components. The first component is water harvesting. The second component is storage. And the third component is access. Water harvesting is not a new concept in Africa, in Kenya. People have been harvesting water but in pails of 20 liters, which hardly serve them. Now we are changing that in a big way. One, we are enhancing the capacity. And by enhancing, we mean we are giving them water tanks. In our project, water tanks 
of um, 10,000 liters for institutions like churches and schools that have a capacity to harvest. And for households, we are giving them 5,000 liter tanks at a cost sharing uh, model where they pay part of it and we supply, um, or rather we finance the other part of it. And basically when the water is harvested, it's filtered. There's a filtration system that is purely um, made by locals, for locals. And this will be through gravel. The system will be having gravel. It will be having sand. It will be having biochar. A massive system made of locally available materials and local labor so that they can filter the water that comes through the surface runoff, which is one of the ways we'll be harvesting, water that has previously been going to waste. And the second form of harvesting is rooftop harvesting. This rooftop harvesting will be um, essentially for drinking. It will be potable water. Once the 5,000 liter is, uh, tank is full for the roof harvesting, the excess goes to a central reservoir. And it's metered. So every household that channels water to the central reservoir, they will know through a project team that will go around each and every time reading the meters the same way they read the meters. Now here is the part or the bit about our project that will actually incentivize people to harvest water. And that is through a water credit system called water bongas. Water bongas means whatever amount of water you channel to the central reservoir, it is, it is recorded and converted into credit points. Then at the time of I mean, when the dry season begins, you can actually redeem the water points, called the water bongas, through a smartphone app. And you would ask, where would you get a smartphone app in arid and semi-arid areas where internet connectivity is an issue? We are using the USSD system. And mobile uh, penetration in Kenya right now is over 90%. So there's no reason why a household should not have a mobile phone. And at the center, we'll be having also um, a facility that will be training uh, local communities on water management, water and sanitation, health, social behavior change communication, so that they view water harvesting and other related issues as something of paramount importance, something that they need to focus on. We could have done this in no any other way other than the model that we are having. And in this way, you'll be able to bridge from one dry season to the other season easily through the amounts of water that will be harvesting. Whatever will be sent to the central reservoir, it's enough for their drinking needs. And whatever will be harvested through the 20 foot boreholes, one meter square diameter, that is what they'll be using for the non-portable uses. Um, or for instance, cooking, they could use it for other uses, uh, watering their animals, watering their plants. And the knock-on effects on this are unbelievable. Apart from the SDG 6 that we are directly addressing, there will be other SDGs on food security, on health, and another one on uh, especially communities that have been fighting over water resources. This is going to be a game changer because never again will they fight over natural resources. Everybody is going to have something they can always fall back to. We are not solving this problem 100%, and no one project in Kenya or in Africa or even in the world solves a problem 100%. We are just contributing to the solving of the water issue that has been as a result of the climate change, that we are not polluting as much as probably the West, but we are the greatest sufferers because we are less equipped to handle the effects of climate change. Through our small contribution, we are here and we are saying, this is our solution and may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> May I now invite the team from the University of Buenos Aires? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to present my, our team, Sebi. Uh, she is Sara Olguin Flores, Laura Yamagochi, and Julieta Sicardi. We are from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. 
15,000 million trees disappeared from our planet every year as a consequence of human depredation of the environment. Facing the challenge of climate change, we understand that saving the forest cover would offer multiple benefits over a long period of time. A change in our environmental consciousness is needed. This is the reason why our project focuses on trees and citizens' awareness. We propose to include the project Seed of Life, Semilla de Vida, in our educational model. The idea is that all the students in the last three years of high school would receive a tree seed and would have the responsibility to take care of it. As a complementary way, we design a virtual seed called SEBI. This is an application that allows following the growth of the seed until it becomes an adult plant. SEBI will grow according to the care that each student provides. As a consequence, it should be reflected on the real seed. The most important thing is that this experience, funny, enraging, and dynamic, will let the children to learn about awareness and will feed sensibility to our environment. At the end, they are going to see their seeds as living beings which are indispensable to our subsistence. Also, SEBI pretends to create a big enough bank of saplings to plant on demanding areas and for reservoir to environmental disasters and deforested regions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to invite the team from ETA and uh, the team who is going to talk about the Nepalese Himalaya. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I begin my summary, I'd like to utilize this opportunity to thank the organizing committee for this wonderful platform to the distinguished guests of honor for your wisdom and generosity, and also for the participating teams for just being so awesome. Uh, it has been an honor to represent Team Europe, although we all three of us come from a different continent. The world is indeed a small village. <laughs> now to the serious part. Uh, in our project, we have tried to address the issue of deglacialization in the Nepalese Himalayas. And we have chosen this particular topic because glaciers act as natural reservoirs. They regulate the hydrological cycle by controlling the flow of water into streams and rivers, particularly during dry seasons when there is no input from snow melt and rain. So in high mountains, the rapid melting of glaciers is one of the most visible impacts of climate change. Studies suggest that by the end of this century, there will be a, high, a diminished, diminished glacier in both size and mass, leaving behind a dilapidated environment consisting of loose debris and sparse vegetation, and more importantly, large number of glacial lakes. So as our solution, we have tried, we have proposed to construct uh, reservoir dams in these deglacialization regions. Now you may ask, is this project too provocative and too bold? Of course it is. it is. Is it fraught with uncertainties? Sure. But is it necessary? And is it consequential? Yes. We say so because it is crucial to understand how the hydrological function of these glaciers can be resuscitated to provide continuous flow of water, not just for the communities downstream, but also for the ecological sustenance of the riverine aquatic habitat and other terrestrial ecosystems. So the main idea of our project is to maintain the hydrological function of these glaciers in these deglacializing mountains. To meet the project's aim, we propose a series of actions starting from the identification of uh, determining the receding glaciers and as well as their future, future state using machine learning algorithms. They will be coupled with remote sensing technologies to inf obtain information about glacier geometry, elevation, terminus position, accumulation, and ablation rates, 
and of course, the overall glacier mass balance. Given the large scale nature of this project, we will develop a tool to map the areas where such dams can be constructed. And then the remaining actions will require multiple stakeholders, including government bodies, both national and international, communities, local communities, and financial sectors, to name a few. In summary, this project entails a climate smart approach that links issues of energy, security, environmental sustainability, agriculture, biodiversity, and disaster risks. Thus, our project includes both mitigation measure and adaptive response to build resilience among various stakeholders and local communities downstream. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now you know the different projects, and now we are going to move to the award. Um, I would like to remind you that we have two third prizes, two second prizes, and one first prize. So I would like to invite the first third prize winner to come to the podium, and Mrs. Annan, if I may, to hand over the prize and the member of the jury who is going to explain why they get the award. And this is the team from Buenos Aires and Masao Takahashi, please. Masao Takahashi World Economic Forum. On behalf of the entire jury group, I express my heart of, heartfelt congratulations to the, all of you, of the teams, Sara, Julieta, Laura. Uh, here I would like to share, uh, share a few comments on the Seeds of Life project. The Seeds of Life project was selected from the many applications from Latin South America and with the three outstanding uh, perspectives. One, that it's a very original proposal that combines the technology with the actual activities. Specifically, in this case, the technology and the education uh, to raise the awareness about the nature and also to change the behavior of the people. Second is a fostering the sense of ownership. One of the unique projects which focus on the awareness buildings in this piece. Third, last not but least, it is a cost-effective and scalable solution. Especially, I'd like to emphasize on the, on the, the unique approach of the, of the, to the second point, the sense of the ownership. This is, more, is one of the most challenging issues on the climate change. The greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, extreme weather, ozone layer depletion, we see, the old, we see and hear that all the news are related to the climate change every day. And we sense that the climate change is a critical thing for all of us. Yet, it is very difficult to trigger the collective actions or the change, our changing of the behaviors. And since it is uh, either the too complex or it's too little counterintuitive. The Seas of Life project uniquely unlock the emotional engagement of the people uh, with the simple and powerful narratives, making the tree, life, of, uh, life of the tree be part of the individual life. So again, so with this, I think they strongly believe that these powerful narr narratives and also the powerful proposals will make the, those, uh, the first step of the people's mind changes and then in involving the peoples uh, to those climate change topics. So I would like to congratulate Sarah Julieta and Laura for this uh, the achievement. And I also wish that the, your Geneva uh, challenge experience is uh, uh, the potential and the powerful seeds 
to boom your career passion on the sustainable landscape designs. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, photo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Masao Takahashi was right in reminding us that we are talking about the ranking among the best because they are the best out of 66. So um, having said that, I would like to invite the second, third prize, which is the team from Kenyatta University and uh, Florian Igli. <laughs> So congratulations to all of you. I'm very, very pleased to see you up on this stage. I think it's amazing that you made the journey to Geneva. Um, you're the best team from Africa. You're among the five finalists. It's really, really amazing. So my um, full-hearted congratulations to, to all of you guys. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, I'll give three points why the jury um, thought that your project was particularly interesting. Um, and, and deserve to be here. And um, the first is it tackles a very, very relevant issue. So it tackles an issue that is not confined to Kenya, although it's a good example, but arid and semi-arid regions and water scarcity in these regions is something that is a much broader phenomenon, certainly in Africa, and it will get worse with climate change. So you tackle this, but you don't tackle it on an abstract level. You actually have the experience from these communities, you know what's happening there. So you don't do background research and then just fill in a template and send in a proposal, but you actually know these people and you know how these communities work and therefore you're able to come up with solutions or ideas for solutions that actually might work. So I think that's the second point that we really, really liked. Um, the third that we appreciate a lot is the proposal in itself, how it was done. Um, it gave a really good overview of other existing initiatives that are there and why yours um, adds, especially on the co-benefits, not just on the water, but from health to schooling to many other factors. And you made a very convincing case. Now, I'd like to end on a very short personal note. We've heard a lot about cooperation, but our individual actions actually matter a lot too. Um, so what I'd like to invite you, but also all the teams, is spend time on this project, try to bring it ahead, go step by step, don't hesitate to get back to us, like send us an email, do harass us, ask us questions, and ask us for connections and anything. That's also part of what, what we would hear, um, what we are here to help you with. And also, in terms of personal actions, consider what you do in your personal lives as well, like what your, the impact of your um, actions on the climate are and how you can make sense of this as sort of like a project for your life, not just this one, but in a wider sort of spectrum. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> Thank you. And now we have um, two second prizes to award, and I would like to invite the first team who gets a second prize, which is the team from Bangladesh. And Janet. Well, like, like 
everyone else, we want to congratulate you guys for a job well done. You're um, one of a, a large number of applicants for this prize and um, very prestigious, I might add. I think it's wonderful that you've won this. Um, as far as the jury selection goes, we were all very impressed with this project. Uh, the fact that the project deals with both the mitigation side, reducing greenhouse gas through sequestration and also through the improvement of the building efficiency with a green roof, but also the resilience side of the story by reducing the heat island effect, which we know is a powerful um, problem, especially in dense cities. So by tackling both of these issues with a very comprehensive and uh, multi-stakeholder process and a well thought out business plan, I think this is very scalable to other cities. You come up with a process that, that and an app that, you know, in a nutshell, creates a network of farmers that want to do um, farming on rooftops or want to rent the space to you so that you do the farming for them, also in connecting it with um, people who want to buy the food. So I think you've got a very sustainable business model and we were all very impressed. So with that, thank you for your, for your time, your effort, and I hope you enjoy Geneva while you're here. Congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat> and now I would like to invite the second team who gets a second prize, and that is the team from ETR and the group from Nepal. Please come to the podium. On behalf of the jury, allow me to also congratulate you. I think you're a unique group in the sense that you are the European group. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. And so congratulations, really. I think the jury felt uh, very impressed uh, with your proposal for three main reasons. I think the first one is relevance. Uh, Melting of glaciers and ice uh, threatens the hydrological cycle and the livelihoods of millions of people around the globe, as you were very well saying. But yet, this is not frequently at the center of our attention. It's more the plight and the challenges of arid zones and of coastal zones. So thank you for bringing that up to, uh, to us, but bringing it up also with a very concrete solution. And I think this is the second reason why we liked so much your proposal is the level of, our, of ambition that you are coming up with. You're coming up with something that was never done before and maybe can be considered very costly. But it's also true that the moment for gradual measures is past. Uh, Dr. Parker was telling us uh, of the challenge that we have ahead of us. So thank you also for trying to go further in imagining a solution that we normally would go. And even if we just carry out phase one of your project, that would already be an incredible contribution because we need knowledge. We need to map the areas and we need to map hazards to the, all those people around those areas. So thank you for that. I'm very uh, passionate about your proposal because I had the chance to live in Peru where glaciers are expected to melt within 12 years. So the, the pressure for taking action is very, very high. The third reason why we liked your proposal is because of its innovation. The proposal scales up an innovative solution that is at the level of research in a Swiss university, and you're trying to bring it up already immediately to, to Nepal. And this is wonderful because I think many times when people think of innovation, people are thinking of bringing up a very original solution, the latest app or the gig economy. And what you are doing is replicating something that has potential somewhere, 
scaling up and contextualizing, and this is the approach that at least I believe should be taken if we are really going to be able to confront the challenge of climate change. And the last uh, reason why we really liked your proposal is because it, it was really very well researched. Uh, you provided a very sound analysis and were able to excite us uh, in a very normally technological and difficult uh, uh, theme and all of us non-engineers were able to understand. So really, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations and I wish you all the best. Go ahead with it. Thank you, Mother Thank you. Thank you. Well, there is one team left. <laughs> I would like you, the team from it, um, from Dash, from uh, the Columbia University, to come to the podium. Martina. Many congratulations to you for this uh, great uh, project proposal. Um, I would like to emphasize that the, uh, this was a mission among many high quality projects that were submitted in the category of North America. So the, steer, the academic steering committee in the first place and later the jury were very impressed by the high quality of your proposal. Your project addresses an important and relevant issue the impact of climate change on the migration of pastoralists in the Western Sahel region. Climate change may not be a direct cause of conflict, yet, without any doubt, environmental transformations have induced pastoralists to move into lands until then occupied by sedentary farmers. This leads to conflict in the region because it minimizes the amount of available resources and increases competition. In this context, the DASH project aims to map and analyze changes in migration patterns, seasonality, and urban and agricultural development using data from satellites, mobile telecommunications, and GPS-enabled systems. The jury believes that this is an excellent and innov innovative solution. The proposal is well researched and offers a detailed and accurate contextualization. The real-time forecasting model using big data analytics and artificial intelligence techniques is a very ambitious tool to develop that could indeed have a wide and positive impact on the region. The project is also well thought out in terms of needs assessment, risk analysis, and implementation. The team has already taken further steps by having discussions with relevant government agencies and by assessing institutional frameworks to leverage the project. Many congratulations to you, Jessica, Alonso, Nigora, Natasha, and G for this great proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. And now I have the very great pleasure to announce a special prize this year, which will be given by SDSN Youth. And uh, I would like to ask um, Dario Pizzelli and the, te the team, which has been chosen by SDN Youth, to come on the podium and to receive the prize. And I should add, at the same time, explain us why you received that prize. 
Um, thank you, Ambassador, uh, Mrs. Anand, Professor Baran, Dr. Parker, the esteemed jury, the academic committee, uh, which, by the way, includes my PhD supervisor, whom I thank also for that. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to award on behalf of uh, all SDS and youth and uh, the wider Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, together with my colleague, um, Kira, who's also based here at the Institute, this special prize to the project uh, Enhanced Sustainable Concrete. Um, through its Youth Solutions Program, and I'll just give a very brief word about uh, why we are so happy to partner with the Geneva Challenge. Through our um, Youth Solutions Program, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network has been working since 2015 to mobilize investments, expertise, and visibility opportunities in support of youth-led innovations that could contribute to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals agreed by the UN in September 2015. These innovations, in order to be able to be supported by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, should demonstrate a transformative vision. They should be based on an integrated approach to potential synergies and trade-offs, showcase the significant skills and innovative approach of their proponents, and appear capable of delivering significant impacts once implemented and scaled. The Enhanced Sustainable Concrete Project undoubtedly possesses these qualities. Cement production constitutes a growing share of direct fossil fuels emissions from the manufacturing sector, which in turn provides over one-fifth of all direct emissions worldwide, raising crucial water use, wastewater treatment issues. Not only does the proposal highlight such a complex interplay of the challenges of climate change, water scarcity, and sustainable production, it also advances a thoroughly researched, promising solutions that we believe can greatly benefit from receiving qualified support from interested mentors and funders. The Sustainable Development Solutions Network is therefore looking forward to collaborating with the project team in order to harness this support thanks to its wide network of research centers, universities, policymakers, and businesses. Thank you again. Thank you. Are, are you going to say yes. perhaps something about your, yeah. Uh, where's the microphone? Here it is. Mm. Forgive me, I'm still quite jet lagged and so bear with me if I uh, stumble through this presentation. Uh, my name is David, uh, this is Blondine and this is Kimberly. Uh, we are uh, the team from the University of Toronto and Blondine as well from the University of Geneva. And so uh, let's get started. So the road to a sustainable future starts by looking at the technologies we have now and at how we can improve them to revolutionize our collective future. The most vulnerable people of our populations uh, are threatened by phenomena such as global warming. They're threatened by poverty, pollution, drought, uh, poor quality of living, issues that are caused or made worse by climate change. Our team wants to propose a product that can potentially combat all of these issues at one time. We want to introduce Enhanced Sustainable Bioconcrete, a concrete material that uses reject brine from water desalination processes instead of drinking water to mix recycled materials and bacteria capable of a process called calcium carbonate precipitation. The result is a strong construction material that can sequester carbon, that can self-heal if cracked, and that can completely bypass the need for brine management and disposal. But what does this mean to communities and what impacts can this have? Well, let's consider some facts. If we reduce our environmental impact by, uh, by improving our concrete, we, in a sense, we are, it has an environmental perspective already. Currently, 170 liters of water are used to produce one cubic meter of concrete, and one ton of carbon dioxide is released per ton of conventional concrete produced. Globally, over six billion tons of concrete is produced per year. By using enhanced sustainable concrete, we can reduce our gas emissions and we can also reduce pressures on water sources. In addition to this, 
We can also avoid direct disposal of brine to oceans, which can reduce harmful impacts and harmful contributions to ocean pollution. Economically, we can save money in coastal regions around the world. The management of brine is a very costly process, and it poses a significant barrier to communities that want to implement water desalination facilities. Furthermore, the rehabilitation and uh, the maintenance of structures is also a very costly process. But without it, structures degrade, and that can have long-term and far-reaching negative social effects. Using waste materials that are recycled and reject brine can save industries a significant amount of money. And the durable and self-healing nature of concrete can save and maintenance costs as well. If we look at it from a social perspective, this concrete also can have far-reaching far effects. According to the United Nations, water scarcity affects over 40% of the global population and is predicted to rise. 44% of humanity live in coastal regions, and they, many of them struggle to have access to fresh water. If we can implement water desalination facilities in these regions and use the reject brine for sustainable infrastructure development, we can drastically improve their quality of life. As it stands, our group has done the desktop study on the science of uh, enhanced sustainable bioconcrete, and we know how beneficial it can be to the global community. Uh, we are currently in the process of developing an, a plan for pilot, a pilot program implementation, and we're beginning to do the research to show, the, uh, show primary results for the efficacy of this product. We are, it's, we we're hoping to meet uh, industry experts and investors now and later who can join us in our journey in making a sustainable future a reality. Uh, and I'd like to end this off by giving a sincere thank you to everybody here participating, to the, the jurors and uh, everyone who helped out with the Geneva Challenge. Uh, it's difficult to follow up with everyone else's thank yous. Uh, they've already said everything, and I can only say sincere thank you from myself <laughs> and all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's continue to talk about the future. Uh, it is my pleasure to announce that next year's edition of the Advancing Development Goals International Contest will be on the challenges of health. Significant uh, strides have been made in reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, or fighting HIV, for instance, yet there are many more efforts needed to fully eradicate a wide range of diseases and address many different persistent and emerging health issues. Ensuring healthy lives and promoting the well-being at all ages is a core to goal number three of the Sustainable Development Goals. In order to achieve universal health coverage and to provide access to safe and affordable medicines and vaccines for all, it is timely to call for innovation and cross-cutting proposals for mechanisms such as prevention and treatment, education, immunization campaigns, sexual and reproductive health care. We therefore will invite master students from around the world and from all academic programs to participate in the 2019 edition of this competition and to devise innovative and programmatic and pro also pragmatic solutions to the challenges of health. I hope as many students as in previous years will participate and help us come closer to reaching goal number three of the SDGs. I guess that's the end. Um, it's almost eight o'clock. Uh, there are no prices anymore to be distributed. 
I hope you enjoyed meeting the Awadis. I would like to end with a quote of Kofi Annan. He used to say, nobody is too young to lead and nobody too old to learn. I hope you have learned something from the wonderful young people who have been with us today. I would like to congratulate all of you once again. I would like to thank once again Mrs. Ahn and Philippe Bura for their help. All the best and have a nice evening. <laughs>